Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage, how to set up and play. First thing you'll do is lay out the game board and you'll first set out all of these political control markers. The game refers to them as PCs or PC markers. Uh, they come in blue for Carthage and red for Rome. So you'll put them on all the predetermined spots on the board. There are 29 blue for the Carthage side and there are 26 spots or spaces for Rome or the red side. Next you'll put out the walled cities on both sides. Uh, this is a special type of political control marker. There are five blue walled cities for the Carthage side and there are eight walled cities that start for the Roman side. Again, put them in the predetermined spots on the board. Next, you'll put out the tribe markers on the tribe spots. There are five neutral or white tribe spaces that start the game. And there are three Carthage, Carthage friendly tribe spots that are in blue. Two in Gallia Cisalpina and one down here in southern Italy. The Carthage friendly tribes um, are considered as a friendly PC, a friendly political control marker in all respects for the Carthage side. So in terms of determining province control, uh, a legal retreat spot, preventing isolation for Carthage, or even uh, creating isolation for Roman PCs, they act as Carthage friendly PC markers. So tribe markers and walled cities are special kinds of political control markers versus the standard type. Whenever the game or strategy cards refer to non-walled, non-tribe PCs, these are the type that they're referring to. There are also several spots on the board that start as neutral that don't have PC markers to start the game. Next, we're going to put out the starting forces for each side and they're pre-printed on the board. So for example, General Hanno for Carthage uh, is gonna start in Carthage and is gonna start with four combat units. So the combat units are right here. These are always public information. You can either put them on the map with the general or you can put them off to the side as long as they're associated with the general. And then the general can go right on the spot to start the game. Hannibal is going to start the game in Saguntum. He starts with eight combat units and two elephant combat units. Elephants are treated as, as regular combat units. It's a special type of combat unit. There's a special event card called African Reinforcements that can bring additional elephants into the game, but always only for the Carthage side. Rome does not have elephants as part of their fighting force. In, additional, in addition to having Hannibal start in Saguntum, he's going to have two generals in his holding box. So Mago and Gizgo are going to start as subordinates to Hannibal, meaning there's multiple generals in the same spot, but they're subordinates to Hannibal, so they go into his holding box on the board. Finally for Carthage is Hesdrubal. He's going to start in New, New Carthage, which is a part of Hispania and he's going to start with two combat units. Rome is going to start the game with two generals on the map. The first one is Publius Scipio. He's going to start in Rome with eight combat units. The other Roman general is Titus S. Longus. He's also going to start with eight combat units, but in Agrigentum. The other generals that are not in the game at the start are just set aside in their spot on the board. You'll also set aside each of their named markers for the generals. These are used during consul election. And then you've got your pro-council marker. All generals have two ratings. The number on the left is what's called their strategy rating. And the number on the right is their battle rating. The left number, the strategy rating, is used for general activation via the strategy cards. So the strategy cards will have ops values of one, two, or three. 
it's better to have a lower strategy rating. So Hannibal with a strategy of rating with one is the best. It means he can be activated with a one, two, or three card. In comparison to maybe a general with a three strategy rating could only be activated with a three strategy rating card. The right number is the battle rating. For here, the higher the better. The battle rating will determine how many battle cards the general will get in combat. And also when performing movement or battle related dice rolls, you're always trying to roll the general's battle rating or lower. So Hannibal with a battle rating of four gives him more options. So whenever they're trying to roll to get initiative during the battle or withdraw from a battle or trying to intercept an army or avoid battle or pursuing, you're trying to roll the general's battle rating or lower. So a four gives Hannibal more options versus a general with a battle rating of one uh, has very few options when trying to make those rolls. Set aside the other markers. You've got political control markers. You've got the siege train that can be brought in the game um, through an event card. You've got siege markers. You have the Carthage combat units which include the extra two elephant units. Uh, four is the hard limit for elephant units. But as we mentioned, they can be brought in the game through an event card. And as we talked about, they get treated like other combat units. They can be part of naval movement and normal land movement. And then you've got all the different Roman combat units, abbreviated as CUs on the strategy cards. You also have the dice that comes with the game, uh, one die for the Roman side and one die with special um, Carthaginian symbols that are listed on the player aid. Or you can just use regular dice with normal pips. Next you'll shuffle both decks used in the game. Uh, the first deck is the battle deck. This is used during combat. And the main deck is called the strategy deck and this is shuffled and cards will be dealt uh, during the strategy phase of each turn. So when we talked about a general strategy related uh, rating, it relates to these operational points on the cards. They can be used for a number of things, um, including um, placing political control markers or activating your generals. Finally, you'll put out your turn marker starting in turn one. The game is played over nine rounds or turns, and the winner ultimately is the side with more political control. So let's discuss victory conditions. I'm using this player aid that shows all the different provinces in the game. There are 18 what are called politically significant provinces. So you can see in Hispania, there's four provinces that are separated by these lines. So to start the game, Carthage controls three of them and one is a neutral or an uncontrolled province. To control a province, you have to have the majority of spaces in the province. So for example, Baetica requires that the player have a minimum of three of the spaces or the cities. That's because in Biatica, there are five spaces. There's the walled city, and there's four regular spaces. So a majority here would be three. So if a player has three, it's under their control. So when the strategy cards refer to control, a player can have control of a specific space or a city. Um, this is a walled city versus a non-walled city. And then in addition, a player can have control of the province if they have the majority of the spaces. Now, it is possible for maybe Carthage to have two of these spots and Rome to have two of these spots. If neither player has the majority of three, Biatica is uncontrolled. So to start the game, Carthage has control of seven total provinces, three in Hispania and four in Africa, which are all four of the provinces in Africa. We've got Western and Eastern Numidia, Carthaginia, and Carthago, which only has one space, which is the city of Carthage. So you can see to control that province, you need to have the one space. Rome, on the other hand, starts the game with nine political control or nine uh, province control. They've got six provinces in Italy, 
Italy on the map, whenever it's referred to on the cards, is this dark red region all the way from the top to southern Italy, but not including uh, um, the island of Sicily. And then provinces are separated with the dark brown lines that can be a little bit tough to see. So Rome starts the game with control of every province in Italy, with the exception of Gallia Cisalpinia. You can see up there it has two blue markers, which are friendly Carthage tribes, but you would need a total of three uh, to control Gallia Cisalpinia since there's five total spots. Rome also starts with control of Sicilia, which requires three PC markers, and Syracuse, which is a one province spot. So this is Sicilia, and then Syracuse is just one walled city spot that is required for control. The other province that Rome controls is Sardinia Corsica, that requires three. It's the island out here with five total spots. So there are 18 total politically significant provinces uh, in the game. Rome starts with nine, Carthage has seven, and two start as neutral. In addition to the significant provinces, there are also four what are called insignificant provinces, meaning they don't contribute to victory conditions. Uh, the first one is up here. It's Gallia Transalpinia. There's Massilla. The third one is Liguria. That starts with two uh, neutral tribe markers. And the fourth one are the Balearic Islands that Carthage starts the game with control of. So the game is played over nine rounds. The winner is going to be the side with more provinces. If it's a tie, Carthage will always win the tie at the end of the game. There are also some sudden death scenarios. If one side never has enough PC markers to remove due to political repercussions, either at the end of a round or at the end of the battle, that will be a sudden death. Also, if Rome ever controls the city of Carthage, that's an instant win for Rome, and vice versa, if Carthage ever controls the city of Rome, that's an instant win for Carthage. Also, if Carthage controls all the provinces in Italy, with the exception of Latium, they would win the game uh, during the victory check phase. Each turn will have five phases. The first phase is the reinforcements phase. This is where Carthage can get up to four combat units and Rome can get up to five combat units. Rome will also elect a proconsul and two consuls during the reinforcements phase. The next is the strategy phase. That's where strategy cards are dealt based on the round number in the game to each side. Third phase is the winter attrition phase. Uh, that's where each side may lose combat units that are occupying unfriendly spaces. So Roman units on a Carthage PC marker would be considered an unfriendly space. Uh, the fourth phase is political isolation. That's where you remove PC markers if they cannot trace their way back to either a friendly combat unit, a friendly port, a friendly tribe, or a friendly walled city. And then the final phase, the fifth phase, is the victory check phase. Both sides will compare how many provinces they control, and the side with fewer provinces has to remove PC markers from the game, or from the board, equal to the difference. So let's go over each of the five phases of a turn in depth now. The first phase of every turn is the reinforcement phase. You're going to skip reinforcements in the first turn of the game. From turn two onwards, uh, the first phase is always the reinforcements phase. Carthage always goes first in the reinforcements phase. And a couple rules. Combat units uh, cannot be placed inside of a besieged walled city. So we'll talk about sieges later. So if an army was sieging a city... You couldn't put reinforcements inside that city. It's obviously being surrounded by an opposing army. Um, also, an enemy general that's on the map without any combat units does not restrict the placement 
Um, basically, if combat units get placed where there's a lone enemy general, that general would get displaced if CUs are put in his spot. Also, there's no stacking limit for combat units. You can have as many combat units in a single space as you'd like. There is a movement limit that we'll talk about later. Maximum movement of 10 combat units can be moved uh, during land movement or during campaigns and other situations, but there's no stacking limit for the number of CUs in a space. You also can't, during the reinforcement phase, put combat units into any space that already has an enemy combat unit. So I've moved some of the generals around to simulate what may have happened in turn one, and then since it's turn two, we'll go through our first reinforcements phase. Carthage always starts. So Carthage can get up to four CUs. Uh, the first combat unit can go with any general on the map. So that's their most flexible um, combat unit. So it can either go with any general on the map, or it can go into their capital of Carthage, or their Hispania capital of New Carthage. So usually that combat unit is sent to maybe reinforce a Carthage general that's moving into Italy, such as Hannibal. You would simply take the combat unit from the supply and add it to that general stack on the board. The second combat unit reinforcement for Carthage can go into Carthage itself. Even if there was no general there, you could just put combat units there, or it could go with any general in Africa. The third and fourth CU reinforcements for Carthage have restrictions. Uh, the first one is as long as New Carthage is controlled by Carthage, uh, Carthage can get one CU in that city, New Carthage, or with any general in Hispania. These are these four territories shaded in yellow. So you could put the CU there in New Carthage or add the CU there to this general since he's in Hispania. The fourth combat unit reinforcement is available for Carthage if they control the province of Baetica. So as long as they have province control over that one, meaning they have at least three spaces there, they get an additional combat unit. And that combat unit can be placed in either New Carthage or any general in Spain. The final step for Carthage is to return any displaced generals. So if, we're, if a general was displaced on the previous turn, you can return them to the board. They can go to any unbesieged space as long as there's friendly combat units in the space. Next is Rome. They can get three combat units in the city of Rome or with any general currently in Italy. So they can make that decision. They could place it there or put it with that general since he's in Italy. Then they can get an additional two combat units, again, either in Rome or with any general on the map. So this general is outside of Italy. Those two combat units could be stacked with his. A major restriction when you're placing Rome reinforcements is that you have to at least have created or have one already on the board, a stack of at least five combat units for a consular army. So just keep that in mind when you're placing your reinforcements. Early in the game, it's not an issue. Uh, just, just make sure that at the end of placing your reinforcements, you have at least one stack on the board with five combat units or more. Before we talk about Roman consuls and proconsuls, I wanted to point out that during uh, the sixth turn of the game, Scipio Africanus, the famous Roman general, will enter the game. Now, he will enter as a permanent second proconsul. He'll come into the game with five combat units in addition to your regular reinforcements, and he can be placed anywhere in Italy or in a Spanish port, which are indicated by these boat symbols. The space has to be friendly, meaning that Rome would have a PC marker on it, and it has to be free of any enemy combat units, and it can't be inside of a walled city. So if, if those conditions don't occur, they're rare, but if they don't occur, Scipio Africanus would never enter the game. So as long as there's a friendly space in Italy or a friendly Spanish port, Scipio can come into the game with his five combat units, 
during turn six. Once Rome has placed its reinforcements, it has the option, the player has the option, of selecting one proconsul. Uh, the proconsul can be selected from any of the generals currently on the map. So in this situation, we have those two choices. Basically, you would use your proconsul marker to indicate that I am going to select this general as my proconsul, and he's going to stay on the map. So after Rome has their option of selecting a proconsul, all other generals are removed from the map, but the combat units stay in their space. So since Rome has selected Titus Longus as their proconsul, he's the only one that can stay on the map, all other generals would now get removed. And just as a reminder, Scipio Africanus gets treated as a permanent second proconsul, so he never has to be removed from the map during this reinforcements phase. After you've removed the generals from the map, Rome is now going to randomly select its two consuls for, the, for this year or for this turn. So if a general was selected as a proconsul, you can exclude his marker and then randomly take the other general markers and randomly select two. So let's say in this example, randomly, uh, A. Paulus and Varro were selected. Now they need to be placed on the map. They can be placed in the same space or in different spaces on the map as long as the space contains those minimum of five combat units. So that's why you had the restriction of having at least one space with five combat units because the new consul requires a consular army uh, of that size. So the generals could be placed in any of these spots. All these spots have at least five combat units. So you can put them in one general in each spot or both generals in the same spot. If there's no alternative for where they can be placed, they can be put inside of a besieged Rome. So I've put them each in their own spot with at least five combat unit stacks. Keep in mind, if you were to put them in the same spot with a proconsul, consuls outrank proconsuls. So this proconsul would automatically become a subordinate of a consul general there and would go into their holding box. And if you put two consuls in the same space, you would decide who is the commanding general and put the second one as a subordinate in that consul's holding box. On a side note, uh, pro-council armies are allowed to be larger than consular armies and they can pass through or leave a consular army as long as that army contains at least five or more combat units, then there's no restrictions. But if a pro-consul with his army um, enters a space containing a consul army and they have less than five combat units, it has to either stop and end its movement or drop off the combat units so the consular army can get replenished back up to the minimum of five combat units. And just as a point of reference, whenever we're talking about armies, we're generally referring to any general on the map with combat units. Once you've completed reinforcements for both sides, you're ready to go to phase two, the strategy phase. The second phase of the game is the strategy phase, where you're going to deal out strategy cards to each player based on the turn. So in the second turn of the game, we're gonna, each player is going to get seven strategy cards from the deck. Now keep in mind, if there's not enough cards in the deck to deal a full hand to each player for the turn, you would reshuffle the entire deck before the deal. The deck is also reshuffled at the start of the next turn when a specific event, number 64, the truce card is played. That card instructs you to reshuffle the deck um, at the start of the next turn. Whenever you reshuffle the deck, you're going to include all the cards that had previously been played or discarded unless the card specifically instructs that it's removed from play after the event has been resolved. So each player, each side, gets their hands, hand of strategy cards. Now Rome can play first if they decide to play a campaign card. And if it's played for either the event or the operational points, they have the option to say, I'm going to play first because I'm using a campaign card. And it can be a minor or a major campaign card. 
Otherwise, Carthage would decide who plays first. Carthage could say, I'm going to play first this turn, or I'd like Rome to play first, if Rome does not exercise the option of starting the round with a minor or major campaign. During the strategy phase, uh, both sides will continue alternate card play one at a time until all cards have been played or discarded. And if only one side has cards left due to a situation like that, then they would be the only side playing their remaining cards until all were exhausted. So let's take a look at the different ways that cards can be played throughout the game. The first way a card can be played is out of turn order as a counter event. These counter events are indicated by these text banners in brown and it'll tell you when the card can be played. So for example, this card, play immediately after opponent moves an armory using C movement. This card can be played as an interrupt and then it gets resolved. The other types of counter events are usually battle related and it says play at the start of any combat phase. So these are played, these special kinds of cards are played out of turn order. Also keep in mind, playing a card like this would not count as your turn. So if the Roman player was using sea movement and the Carthage player countered it with a storm at sea, you'd resolve that and then it would be the normal Carthage player's turn. But actually on your turn, there are two ways that a strategy card can be played. It can be played for the event, as long as it's an eligible event, cards with blue OP numbers mean that, that that event can only be played for the Carthage side. Red numbers means that event can only be played by the Roman side. And if it has red and blue, the event, for example here, could be played by both sides. Instead of playing the card for the event, the player can play the card for the operational points. And the, the color does not matter. So since this Carthage player has an event that can only be played for Rome, they can decide, you know what, obviously I cannot play the event, but I can play this as a three ops card and take advantage of a three ops, uh, three ops points. The numbers range from one to three, so three is the highest. There are three types of things you can do with your ops points. The first thing, and this first option requires that it's a three ops card. You couldn't do this with a one or a two ops card, but you can add one combat unit to a general. As long as the general was in a friendly space in a friendly province, you could add one combat unit. So this general on an unfriendly Roman spot or this general in an uncontrolled territory aren't eligible, but maybe you could use that three ops card to add one combat unit to this general because he's in a friendly space in a friendly province. The other restriction is you could never put that combat unit inside of a besieged walled city. So if the army was attacking your city and had siege points against it, you couldn't get that combat unit inside of that city. The second action you can take with your operational points are to place PC markers equal to the ops values. So if I played this card for the ops points, I could place one PC marker versus playing this card would allow me to place uh, up to three PC markers. PC markers can go onto any empty space on the board, uh, but they can't go onto a space that already has a tribe PC marker, an enemy PC marker, or an enemy combat unit. But as long as it's completely empty, player could play that three ops card and place a blue marker there, a blue marker there, and a blue marker there. Gallia Cisalpina, they only need three spots, so now Carthage would now immediately have control of that province. In addition to placing PC markers on empty spaces, you can also convert enemy PC markers as long as there's at least one combat unit on the spot. So for each ops point, you can convert a PC marker. So maybe I use this three ops card and I'm gonna use one of the ops points since I have a combat unit here to simply flip that. And since this general is there with combat units, I can flip this one. 
and then I can use my third one to maybe place one in an empty spot. So you can mix and match. Basically, uh, it's any empty space on the board or any enemy space as long as you have one of your friendly combat units on it. Be very mindful of isolation that we'll talk about later. Uh, you may not want to put PC markers that are at the risk of being isolated. So on a prior turn, Rome obviously put those two PC markers there because they knew they were safe because a port a combat marker, or I'm sorry, a PC marker and a port prevents isolation. But they just want to make sure that we'll see in the isolation phase. Then when you place these PC markers, be mindful of that. The final thing you can do with your operational point card uh, is to activate one general. As long as their strategy rating is equal to or less than the ops value of the card. So if I wanted to activate General Hanno, we can see he needs a value 3 card. Whereas if I wanted to activate Hannibal with a strategy rating of 1, I can basically use any of my cards. It gives me more flexibility. I can use that card for 1 ops to activate Hannibal since he has a strategy rating of 1. I want to point out that there are some cards that are considered hybrid cards, and it's usually in the text. Um, so for example, this native guide card, if you use this card as an OC to move an army, OC means operational card, meaning I'm going to use the operational points of the card to activate a general. So let's say I use the two, two ops points to activate Hannibal, so I'm using it in that manner, then I get the benefit of this text here. So if I'm using it to move an army and the army crosses a mound pass, I can modify my mound pass attrition roll by minus three. So I'm using the card for the ops points to activate a general, but it's triggering the benefit of the card. Whenever you're activating a general and possibly moving the army, that can result in a siege, a subjugation, or even a battle. So we're going to talk about movement separately later. But as we talked about during the strategy phase, cards get played one at a time. Um, alternately, you resolve the effects of the cards, you resolve the effects of movements and battles. All this happens during the strategy phase. So most of the action of the game is happening during the strategy phase. And then once all the cards have been played during a specific turn, you're ready to move on to phase three, which is winter attrition. So phase three, winter attrition. Basically, all combat units, with or without a general, as long as they're in an unfriendly space, an unfriendly space is a space with an enemy PC marker or an enemy walled city, whether it's besieged or not, or unfriendly tribes. If combat units are in an unfriendly space, they suffer attrition. And each combat unit group on those spaces are going to have to roll on the attrition table. The column they roll on is going to be based on the number of CUs in the space. So if there was only one combat unit in a space, in an unfriendly space, they would roll. And you can see nothing would happen unless they rolled a 6. And they would have to lose that one combat unit. What the E means is that if there was an elephant present as a combat unit, that would have to be the first combat unit lost. So looking at this board, we can see this general's in a friendly space. So he's okay, the combat units I mean, they're in a friendly space. These combat units, remember it's with or without a general, are in an unfriendly space. That's a blue space, so that's a tribe friendly to Carthage. So they're going to have to roll on the attrition table. These combat units are in friendly spaces. Hannibal's in a neutral space, so that's fine, as long as it's not unfriendly. These combat units are okay. This combat unit, even though he's with a general, doesn't matter. He's in an unfriendly space. So these combat units are going to have to roll for attrition. During winter attrition, Rome always goes first. So even though we found a situation for Carthage, we also have this situation for Rome. So they have to go first. So they have three combat units in an unfriendly space. They would roll on column three of the attrition table. And let's say they just roll a 1, so they're safe. So nothing happens to the combat units. So we'd go to the next one. If Rome had any more spaces, we'd resolve those, and then Carthage would resolve theirs. 
So we can see this, uh, this army here has five combat units in an unfriendly space, so they would roll on the five or six column. And let's say they rolled a six, they would have to lose two combat units. And if there were any elephants present, the elephant would have to be the first combat unit lost. So you just would subtract the combat units from the force. Also, attrition rolls um, do not displace generals. So even if a general on a space lost all of their C CUs due to winter attrition, the general would simply stay on that space. They don't get displaced. After winter attrition, phase four is political isolation. Again, Rome has to go first. You'll remove all isolated PC markers, uh, not walled cities or tribes, but regular PC markers, unless they can trace a path to a friendly combat unit, a tribe, a port, or a walled city. They have to be friendly. So it has to be a friendly tribe, a friendly port, or a friendly walled city. The friendly walled city is even eligible, even if it's being besieged, as long as it's friendly. Uh, the enemy, the presence of enemy combat units on a friendly space has no effect, as long as you can trace your path. The path can cross straights, it can cross friendly PCs, and it can even cross empty spaces, as long as they're completely empty, no combat units. Uh, the paths cannot cross mountain passes, neutral or enemy tribes, or enemy PC markers. Um, unless, obviously, there's a friendly combat unit present. So let's take a look at some examples. So, for example, all of these PC markers can trace a path through other friendly PC markers to both a friendly walled city. They can also trace to these ports, so they're all safe. This one Roman PC marker is also safe, even though there's a Carthage combat unit on it, doesn't matter, because... It's in a spot with a port. So this is a friendly port, so that PC marker is safe. Let's look at this Roman PC. I think it's isolated. It cannot trace to these spots. These are Carthage-controlled blue spots. Now it can go through empty spaces, so maybe it can try to trace to this city. But remember, you cannot trace a path across a mountain pass. And that squiggly line indicates a mountain pass, either an Alps or a non-Alps pass. So it could not trace across there. So basically, you're trying not to get blocked. And this one is blocked because these Carthage symbols are blocking it. So this Roman PC marker would simply get isolated and it would get removed. Remember, Rome always goes first during isolation. So you would remove all the isolated Roman markers first, which may create uh, better opportunities for the Carthage side when they're evaluating isolation. This Roman PC marker can trace a path through this empty spot to this friendly city. It's also a friendly port, so it's fine. But let's say there was a combat unit there. Obviously, it couldn't trace a path through this empty spot if there was a combat unit. So this would get isolated, and that would get removed with the presence of that combat unit. Once you finish Rome isolation, you look for Carthage isolation. You can see that Carthage marker up there can trace to a friendly tribe, so that's okay. This marker can trace to this friendly combat unit, doesn't matter that there's no marker there. It's friendly combat unit that it can trace to. This one, we know it can't trace through the pass, and it looks like it's blocked by these neutral tribes here. You cannot trace through neutral tribes, and it can't trace through that enemy PC marker, so this one would be isolated and removed for Carthage. Even this example is okay for this PC marker, because even though Rome has a PC marker there, this marker can trace to a friendly combat unit. Now, Hannibal and his army would have had to roll for attrition during winter attrition because it's on an empty space, but during political isolation, as long as you can trace to a friendly combat unit, you're fine. Once you've completed phase four political isolation, you move to phase five, which is the victory check phase. Basically, you're just calculating the difference in province control, and the side with fewer provinces have to remove PCs equal to that difference. 
and you can never remove your cities or your tribes. So based on this calculation, Rome has nine provinces of the 18 controlled, where Carthage has eight. So since Carthage trails by one, they have to remove one PC marker from anywhere on the board. Uh, so maybe they'll decide, you know what, I'm just going to remove that from the board. The game is lost immediately if one side cannot remove PC markers to meet the requirement. Also, Carthage would win in this victory check phase if they controlled all the provinces in Italy uh, with the exception of the Latium province, which includes Rome. But if they, if they controlled every other province in Italy, they would win the game in this victory check phase. If it was the last turn of the game, the end of the last turn of the game, the side with more provinces would win the game. And if it was a tie, a tie Carthage would win the tie. But if it's not the last turn of the game, simply advance the turn marker and start with phase one reinforcements phase for the next turn. So now that we've covered the five main phases of a turn, let's talk about all the different things that can happen during the strategy phase, starting with movement basics. The first thing you consider is who is the commanding general of the army. And that only happens if there's uh, more than one general in the same space. Most of the time, the player can decide who the commanding general will be before the activation, except in a couple situations. Uh, Hannibal outranks all other Carthaginian generals. So even though these two generals were in the same space with him, Hannibal outranks them. So he has to be the commanding general. Also, as we talked about, consuls outrank proconsuls. So if there's two consuls in the spot, you can decide which of the two consuls. Also keep in mind, there could be a possible change of command between the two consuls uh, at the start of a battle phase. Any subordinates to a commanding general always go in that general's holding box and their special ability cannot be used. It's only the special ability of the commanding general that can be used. Combat units on the board can only be moved if they're led by a general, and that what, that's what constitutes an army. There's a maximum of 10 combat units that can ever be moved by a general. So if there were more than 10 combat units stacked with this general, when this general was activated and moved, only 10 could travel with him. You can drop off and pick up uh, both combat units and subordinates along the way. Uh, you can't ever pick up a higher ranked general, but as long as the general was lower ranked, you could pick them up. Uh, as, as we talked about, you can also drop off or pick up combat units. So as long as I had a strategy card of two, I could op activate um, Hasdrubal here. And he may decide, you know what, I'm going to take him. I'm going to move one space here. I'm going to pick up that combat unit. I'm going to move a space here, drop off that combat unit, and end my movement here. An activated general has four movement points to use. Movement to a normal space or across a normal line costs one movement. So what that general just did was one, two, three. They still have one movement point left. They could end their movement early or they could maybe move here or here and use their four full movement points. Anytime an army crosses a mountain pass represented by these squiggly lines, that costs two movement points. So let's say on a turn I activated Hannibal and I want to move him across this mountain pass. And since it's in white, it's an Alps pass. That would cost two movement points to go there. And then I'd have two movement points left. I could end my movement or I could go three, four, or end on three. But crossing a mountain pass costs two movement points. In addition to the two movement points for crossing a mountain pass, Anytime an army passes a mound pass, they have to roll on the attrition table to represent the danger of crossing the mound pass. The column used is always equal to the combat units in the army. So since Hannibal was activated in this example, and they crossed the mountain pass with 10 combat units, 
before they continue their movement, even though they've got two movement points left, they have to roll on the attrition table. And he would have to roll in this 10 column since he had 10 or more combat units. So based on the die roll, he could lose immediately a specified number of combat units. Again, if it's all the way down here, the first one would have to be an elephant. It would be a total of three total combat units lost, including the elephant. And that's shown right there in the attrition table. If there's an E, one of the three combat units have lost has to be an elephant unit. Also, there's a modifier if you're crossing a non-Alps pass. This is actually errata. This should be a minus two. So if you're crossing a non-Alps pass, for example, this one, it's not as treacherous. So you actually get a minus two modifier to your die roll. So you'd roll your die and let's say you got a three, you'd minus two, so you'd only look at the one row to see what your loss was. Again, you'd be using this column if you had 10 combat units. Straights also require two movement points to cross, and there's a special straight right here. It's hard to see, it's a dotted line, but to cross this Masana Strait, you have to have control of both these cities in order to cross the strait. Enemy PC markers do not affect land movement, so this general, if activated, could use their movement points to move through or to these enemy PC markers. One, two, three, four, four movement points since these are standard land movements. But keep in mind, only an army, so that's a general with combat units, can enter a space with other combat units or enemy combat units. Lone generals even if they don't have combat units, can move by themselves. They can move through other lone generals. They just can't stop on the same space as another lone general. And then finally, consular armies, so armies led by a Roman consul, can only move if they have at least five combat units. So no movement can ever leave a consular army with fewer than five combat units. Naval movement requires three movement points to use. So this general, if activated for naval movement, could use their first movement to move to a port and then use all three of their remaining movement points to move from port to port. So another space with a port icon on the board. Alternatively, if they started their activation already on a port, they could use their first three movement points to move to another port and use that last movement point to move a space after landing. To use naval movement, it does require a strategy card with a value of three, either a campaign card with a value of three or a regular strategy card with three ops points and it has to have the symbol of a ship on it. So that's the reminder that this card can be used for naval movement. The combat unit limit uh, for naval movement is only five combat units unless you're using a campaign card and it's in the tech. So if you're using a campaign card for naval movement, uh, one of the generals can travel and have actually up to 10 combat units accompany them on the naval movement. We'll talk about campaign cards later, but only one of the two generals activated. So for example, this minor campaign can activate two generals. Only one of the generals activated can actually use naval movement as part of their activation. You can embark and disembark from and to any port space, even if there's an enemy PC marker on the space. So this army could uh, embark from this port space and even move uh, to this port space, even though there's an enemy PC marker, and even though there's a combat unit there. That's okay to land on a space with a combat unit. What you couldn't do is go directly into or out of a besieged city. So if this general and his units were actually inside of the city and Rome was besieging it, you couldn't activate him to escape the city through naval movement, nor could you go to another um, city and immediately go inside the city if it was being besieged. The Roman side during the Second Punic War 
has naval supremacy, meaning they can move freely from port to port. Whereas the Carthage player, when they do naval movement, they actually have to roll on the naval combat table. So when Carthage sails, it requires a die roll, a modified die roll of one or less to succeed. So it's very difficult. If they roll a two, they're forced to return to the port where they left. And if they roll a three or higher, the ship is sunk. If the ship is sunk, all CUs are lost and the general is displaced. Fortunately, the naval combat die roll for Carthage can be modified in a number of ways. The first thing you look at is the port, mort, uh, the port modifier uh, for the both sides. So leaving from New Carthage is a minus two to the die roll. And if they were landing in Carthage, it's an additional minus two. So both ports are cumulative. So in this case, this would be a minus four modifier to the die roll. Whereas if they were coming to this port, you could see it's only a minus one. So the cumulative effect on that roll would be a minus three. Whereas if they were trying to sail from New Carthage, minus two, and sail directly to Rome, which is a plus two, that would wash out. So it'd be a zero uh, net. So the first type of modifiers are the port modifiers. Another modifier is if the port contains a Roman PC marker, and it's for both ports. You can see applies to the embarkation and the debarkation, and they're cumulative. So for example, if this Carthage general was trying to do naval movement, you'd obviously do the port modifiers, and since there's a Roman PC marker, this would be plus one to the die roll, so it's not gonna help them. And if they were trying to sail to this one, that's an additional plus one because of the Roman PC marker. So you take Roman PC markers into account, uh, they're plus one each for either port, and then you, as we talked about, they're cumulative with the individual port modifiers. What can help Carthage, they can get a minus one if the general's moving without any combat units, or if the sea movement contains only one combat unit. Also, if Carthage controls Syracuse, that's a minus one modifier to the die roll. So that could happen naturally through play, or there could be an event that gives them control of Syracuse. There are some modifiers down here that you just simply mark. So if Syracuse um, is allied with Carthage, you can just put that there to remind you that you have a minus one modifier to your naval combat roll. Also, there's two specific events. If Macedonia is allied with Carthage, that's a minus one die roll. So that's right here. You can put that here as a reminder when the event gets played, that the event has been played and Carthage has a minus one die roll. And or if the event has been played for a Carthaginian naval victory, you may also have that one or this one instead. These can, again, be cumulative. So if the Carthage player had all three of these conditions met, that would be minus one to minus three to their die roll in addition to the other modifiers. If Rome in a subsequent round ever plays the Macedonia event, they could cancel the effect of the alliance, removing the modifier. Ideally, Carthage would modify their die roll to the point where they would modify it uh, down to a one, not even requiring a roll and getting an instant success simply through the modifiers, if that's possible. One other modifier that's a general ability is General Mago. If the Carthage ship is unfortunately sunk, all the combat units are lost. There are no political consequences for losing those CUs. They're just simply removed. Generals are displaced. Also, there's an event called the Truce event. When the Truce is in effect, Carthage is not subject to the naval combat table. An important consideration for all movement is it's done one space at a time, thus giving the other side the chance to react to the movement through either cards or an interception attempt or other things that could possibly alter or stop or change 
uh, the movement of an activated general. So let's cover all the different types of movement interaction that can result from an activated general. The first one is overrun. If a general is ever moving to or through a spot, as long as the army has five or more combat units with them, they can overrun and eliminate a single lone enemy combat unit and then continue their movement points. There would be no battle. So as long as this general and his army had at least five combat units, they could use their first movement point to move here. Since that's a lone enemy unit, they would simply be eliminated and they could continue their movement points. That's an overrun. The next interac interaction is general displacement. So generals can become displaced if a general is alone, so they have no combat units with them for whatever reason, and an opposing army enters the space. That would displace the general. So a displaced general just gets removed temporarily from play, and they can be brought back in uh, during the reinforcement phase uh, of the next turn. For the Carthage player, they can freely bring them back in. For the Roman player, they'd have to be elected as a consul to get back in the game. Also, if a general's ever alone after a, a retreat or after naval combat unit losses, then they're also displaced. Uh, generals do not get displaced, though, um, if they're left alone after rolling on the standard attrition table. Also, if Hannibal or Scipio Africanus are displaced during the game, they are completely eliminated and removed from the game. And if it's Hannibal, for the Carthage side, Carthage also has to remove five PC markers immediately from the game as a penalty for losing Hannibal. Let's talk about walled cities. So walled cities have two characteristics, um, very few, but some have a modifier to sieges. So if Syracuse was ever attempted uh, to be sieged, uh, the sieging army would get a minus one modifier on their die roll. Also, there's a capacity on all cities for the number of combat units that can exist or hide within the city walls. So the active general if this general was active in moving his forces, at the end of movement, they could decide how many of the forces are inside the city as long as they abide by the capacity of the city walls. Keep in mind that is only eligible as long as the city is not currently under siege. Now the inactive player can decide how many um, combat units are inside the city if an active player arrives. So let's say An Hannibal made a movement and came into this spot, the inactive player could decide, you know what, my general and two combat units are going to go inside the city walls of Syracuse, and the remaining CUs would have to be on the outside to engage in battle with the entering general and army. So combat units and or generals can enter into a walled city, um, as long as it's not being besieged, to, to possibly avoid battle or avoid being overrun by an entering army. Any combat units inside of the walled city cannot be attacked. They're only destroyed if the city is successfully sieged. So next let's talk about sieges and subjugations. We use the same procedure for both. Walled cities can only be converted to the other side if they're successfully sieged. Likewise, tribe markers can only be removed through subjugation. Any activated general with at least three or more combat units ending their move on a space can attempt a roll on the siege table. So for example, if we activated that Roman army and he has at least three combat units, at the end of his move on this tribe marker, he can start a subjugation. That would happen at the end of his move. To subjugate, you basically look at the siege table because it follows the same procedure. You roll the dice, and then based on the die roll, the left side of this result is the number of siege points you gain, and the right side are the number of combat units lost in the siege attempt. So in this example, on the siege table, 
if this Roman army rolled a six, they would get two siege points. That would be the best result. They would get two siege points towards the subjugation of this tribe, and you would place that right there. Instead, if they would have rolled a three, they would only get one siege point or subjugation point, and they would have had to lose one combat unit from their sieging force. Also, uh, the same general cannot battle and siege with the same activation. So if Hannibal was activated and they were moving into this city, if there were no combat movement, combat units in the city, and they ended their movement, they could immediately roll on the siege table as part of that activation. But since there are combat units, they're going to have to go into battle first and then be reactivated to attempt a siege roll. But let's say Hannibal did do that move. They engaged with bat in battle with these combat units. Let's say they were victorious. That was the end of their activation. And then on a subsequent strategy card play, they could now attempt the siege roll on this city. There are some modifiers to sieging. There are three cities that have that minus one modifier. Syracuse, Rome, and Carthage, you can see, have the minus one modifier. So the sieging army gets a minus one on the siege table. Also, Carthage always gets a minus one modifier on the siege table unless they have a siege train accompanying their army. And this can enter the game uh, through an event. The besiege status of a city or a tribe only starts once the first siege marker is placed on the city. So even if the army moved in and attempted a siege, if the roll was a failure and no marker would, would get placed, then this city is not considered yet to be under siege. It's not until the first uh, point of siege is placed on it. Also, only one roll attempt can be allowed against each city or tribe per strategy card, even if it's a campaign. So if I played a campaign that had two activations, I couldn't activate and siege and then use another activation to siege against the same city. So for a single card play, only one roll can be attempted against each city or tribe. The siege of a city or a tribe will stay active as long as there's an army in the space. Even if the army is less than the three combat unit, si the three combat unit size to attempt the siege roll, as long as there's some army still in the city with some force, the siege status will stay in place. The siege will automatically end or get canceled um, if and when the besieging CUs leave or get defeated, and you would simply just remove all the siege points because it was not successful. But keep in mind, the siege will stay active as long as there's an army there, so you don't have to immediately attempt another siege roll in your next card play. You can do it several cards later. But to continue a siege, you would have to activate the general, either on the space or a general moving to the space, and again roll on the siege table. And if you got another success, you would just add that to the siege markers present. The siege is successful once three siege points have been accumulated against the city or a tribe. Just keep in mind that the action of sieging and rolling on that siege table always requires that you have a minimum of three combat units. Even if it's an event being played that doesn't require a roll. For example, there's an event called the Traitor in Tarentum. If you were sieging in Tarentum, uh, to play that and to actually get the siege benefit, you would still have to have a combat force of three CUs or greater. So once on an activation, we accumulate our third siege point. This siege would be successful. Any combat units that were inside the city, that hid inside the city, would automatically get eliminated. Any generals that were hiding inside the city would get displaced. And then the city would be instantly converted to the besieging army side. And then you would just clear these siege points. 
if it's a tribe and it got its third point, it would be considered to be subjugated. So you would simply remove the tribe marker and you could replace it with one of your own. And then again, just clear all the siege points and that's now a Roman poli politically controlled space. One last rule about uh, sieging. A besieged army, so an army that's inside the city, can actually, what's called sortie, they can sortie outside of the city's walls to initiate or reinforce a battle in that city's space. And only that sortie force that reinforced the battle could retreat back into the besieged city if the battle was lost. So that's how sieges and subjugations work. Next, let's talk about interception. So interception is performed by the non-active side. So it can be attempted whenever an active army or general enters an adjacent space, either through land or sea movement. So if this Roman general was activated, and let's say they wanted to get down to here, maybe they want to do a siege on this city and they want to use their four movement points, one, two, three, four. This is why you only ever move one space at a time because you're allowing for the non-active player to react. So once the active player moved into this spot here, an interception attempt can be made. So the way it works is once the active player has moved one space where an interception is eligible, the non-active player has to immediately declare, I'm going to make an interception attempt. They've got to declare which generals making the attempt, if there were multiple generals in this spot, and how many combat units would attempt to intercept that general. If there were any generals left behind, they'd have to at least command one combat unit, otherwise just move the entire force in with all your generals. Also, if you're leaving a consul behind, as always, a consul has to remain with at least five combat units. Each intercepting army would now roll the dice, and the interception is successful if you roll a number equal to or less than the general's battle rating. So since Hannibal has a high battle rating of 4, anything 4 or lower would be a success for Hannibal attempting this interception. You do, however, modify the interception die roll by a plus 1 if the target space contains an enemy PC marker uh, without any of your friendly combat units. So since there's a Roman PC marker there, the interception is a little bit more difficult. Hannibal would get a plus one to the die roll. Let's say it was this example instead, where Carthage had at least one combat unit here. So since there's at least a combat unit, Hannibal doesn't get the die roll modifier. So if this general attempted to come in here, before the overrun would happen, if the interception was successful, Hannibal and his intercepting army would move in to join that one combat unit. So the plus one modifier is only if uh, the target space contains an enemy PC marker and no friendly combat units. But in this example, let's, let's assume it fails. Let's say Hannibal rolled a six, so it wasn't a four or less, so that interception attempt failed. So this general would move in, this combat unit would get overrun, and that would be one movement point, and then this general can continue their movement points. They've got three left. The activated army didn't have to declare their entire movement, they just go one space at a time. So after that failed intercept, they can decide, you know what, am I going to keep moving along this sea path to get to here, or do I now want to go against this army that tried to fail, that tried to intercept me but failed? Because if an army fails an intercept attempt, they can't avoid battle. We'll talk about avoiding battle, but if you fail intercept, you can't even attempt to roll to avoid the battle. So Varro could move in to try to attack Hannibal right now using the one movement point. But let's say instead they want to continue their movement. So the non-active side can intercept once from each space with a general or a subordinate and a portion of their CUs like we talked about, but they can intercept 
uh, each time the condition occurs. So now that Varro has moved to another space, any eligible army can target that space, and you can target it with multiple armies. So let's say Hannibal doesn't attempt the intercept. They say, no, I'm not going to attempt an intercept, because they get the sense that Varro is moving down the coast. And so Varro continues his movement. So in this situation, now there's two armies that are adjacent to this target space. Now you can only attempt one interception attempt for each of these, but both of them can attempt to intercept this spot. So the non-active player has to declare, yes, I'm attempting interception, and I'm attempting with Hannibal and all of his forces, and Hasdrubal with maybe a portion of his forces or all of his forces, they're both going to make an interception attempt against this target space. So both of these generals would roll separately. Obviously you have to have a general to intercept because you're comparing it against their battle rating. Um, Hannibal would be successful on a four or less. Hasdrubal would be successful on a three or less. So you may have a situation where one, both, or neither of them are successful in terms of intercepting Varro on this move. Each army that's successful in intercepting is now moved into the space. So in this example, let's assume both armies were successful in their intercept role. Both armies and the declared forces would now move into this space, and that would end the movement uh, for the activated Roman general. Since we had multiple armies that were successful, all the forces are combined for Carthage under one commanding general, and we know Hannibal outranks all other Carthage generals. So Hasdrubal would go into Hannibal's holding box, and now Hannibal's the commanding general over all the combined forces that intercepted Varro in this spot. The benefit of intercepting is the intercepting army is going to get an additional battle card uh, during the battle. They always only get one additional battle card, even if multiple armies were successful. So here, two armies were successful, but it's still only a plus one battle card when we get to the battle phase. And keep in mind, the interceptor is not considered the attacker. So the Roman general was the active player. So they're always considered uh, the attacker. It's the active player would still play their battle card first during the battle phase. That's also important when it comes to the retreat procedure. The active player always has to retreat to the spot where they entered the battle, whereas the defender uh, has more options in the retreat. So even though this army intercepted, they're not considered the attacker. attacker. So they have more options if they lose the battle and are forced to retreat in terms of where they could retreat to. But a battle is not inevitable here. The intercepted army, Varro in this case for Rome, has the option. They can choose to battle uh, with Hannibal or they can back up one space to their last occupied space, which would end their movement. So in this example, Varro has the option to stay and fight Hannibal, or they could back up to their last occupied space, which is that. If their last occupied space was across a mountain pass, they would have to re-roll on the attrition table. And if it was a naval crossing, they would have to roll again on the naval combat table. And if they got a return result, uh, they would have to stay and fight the battle. A couple restrictions to interception. Uh, you can't intercept into a space with a non-moving enemy combat unit. You're only really intercepting movement. You can't intercept from across a mountain pass or a strait. You can't intercept uh, from inside a walled city if you're hiding inside a walled city and there's enemy combat units outside that city. And you can't intercept and then immediately escape into the walled city. The battle would happen first. And then finally, you can't intercept an army that's retreating, withdrawing, avoiding battle, or intercepting. You can only intercept primary movement. Also, if Varro did decide to back up, and this was a tribe space or a walled city space, since he's ending his movement there, he can still attempt um, a siege roll or a subjugation roll. Also, if the active army was moving into their own friendly city, so let's say Carthage was activated and their general was trying to move uh, to New Carthage by land and they got intercepted by a Roman general, 
the battle would happen first. They couldn't move here and then try to hide inside the city. If they got intercepted in their own friendly city, the battle would happen first before they could escape into the city walls. And it's a little different if the Carthage army was moving by sea. So if they were coming from another port into New Carthage, they have got more options. They can either accept the battle, they can move into the walled city if they fit, or they can even back up to their start port. They could even split up their army uh, between the ones going inside the city and the ones backing up. They just can't back up and then also leave combat units outside the walled city. So now that we've covered interception, let's talk about avoiding battles and general pursuit. If an active army, let's say Rome was active, and if, if an active army enters the space of a non-active uh, general and army, they can attempt to avoid the battle. They don't have to stay and fight. And this can be a general with an army and combat units, or this can be a lone general. Either way, they can attempt to avoid, as long as there's a general, because you're going to evaluate um, the role against their combat rating. You'll also remember from earlier, this isn't a walled city space, but if it was, they always have the option when the active player moves in to move inside of the walled city if there's capacity. But since this isn't a walled city, the only option they really have is to stay and fight the active general and army moving in, or they can attempt to avoid battle. So the procedure is the general, the non-active general, would roll, and as long as they can roll equal to or less than their combat rating, they successfully avoid battle. As a reminder from the interception example, whenever an army fails an intercept, they can no longer avoid battle. So let's say as Varro was moving down, if Hannibal tried to intercept and failed, and then Varro made the decision to come after Hannibal, he couldn't even attempt a roll to avoid battle. But let's say that's not the case. Let's say there wasn't an interception attempt. Varro's moving into this space. Hannibal successfully rolls a four or less and avoids battle. The general that just successfully avoided has to move into an adjacent space. They can't move into a space with an enemy PC marker, an enemy combat unit, a hostile tribe, or the space that the army is advancing from but they can move into a friendly or even an empty or a neutral space. So Hannibal, having successfully avoided battle, can move to here, 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 or here. Those are all adjacent spaces. What he couldn't do is avoid battle over a mountain pass. You also couldn't avoid battle and then move across a strait, and as we talked about, he couldn't avoid battle and then move into the space where the active army just came from. So in this example, Varro moved into here, Hannibal successfully avoided battle, and let's say he moved here. So he had to move one space away. Now he does have the option of leaving some combat units and or generals behind. He could also avoid with a subordinate. So a, a subordinate could attempt uh, to avoid battle and then leave. But you always have to leave at least one combat unit uh, with the commander. And again, if it's a consul army, you've got to leave them with at least five combat units. So since the non-active army was successful in avoiding battle, the active army, if they'd like to continue moving, would have to succeed in a pursuit roll. So they would roll the dice. And as long as the value was equal or less than the general's battle rating, so in this case it'll be a difficult die roll, but if Varro was able to roll a 1, they could succeed on their pursuit. And then they've got a couple options. They can continue whatever remaining movement points they have to move to another adjacent space, or they could continue in their pursuit of that general. So let's say Varro succeeds in his pursuit roll, and he decides instead of moving to one of these spaces, he's going to come right there and come after Hannibal again. Hannibal again has the option to continue avoiding battle. So as long as he can roll a four or lower again, he can avoid battle again and again move to an adjacent spot that covers the rules we talked about. Let's say Hannibal failed uh, this time. He rolled a six and he failed to avoid battle. So he's got to stay and fight the incoming army, and also the penalty 
um, for failing to avoid battle is he's going to lose one battle card uh, during the battle process. Also, if this was a lone general without any combat units and they failed to avoid battle, they would simply become displaced. If instead Varro failed his pursuit roll, that would simply end his movement. All, all remaining movement points would be forfeited. But if he did end his movement on a tribe space or an enemy city, walled city space, he could attempt a siege roll. One final point about avoiding battle is normal movement rules apply. So if Hannibal had a force of greater than 10 combat units and Varro uh, entered his space and Hannibal successfully avoided battle, he could only move with up to 10 combat units to an adjacent space. The remaining combat units would have to stay in the space and fight the incoming army. Let's now cover battle in Hannibal. We initiate a battle when an army moves into a space with enemy combat units that do not avoid battle. The moving army must end its movement. So in this example, let's assume Varro moved into Hannibal's spot and Hannibal did not attempt to avoid battle. He wants to fight. The first thing you check for is if both consuls are in the battle for Rome. If that's the case, we may have to do a change of command die roll. It's mandatory if Carthage attacks, but if Rome attacks, it may be requested by Carthage that we do the die roll. Basically, you roll the dice, and on a roll of four or higher, the subordinate immediately becomes the commanding general. But again, this only gets evaluated if both Roman consuls are in the battle. The next step in the battle sequence is to play battle-related strategy cards. So these cards would come from your hand of strategy cards. The attacker plays first, and keep in mind the active player is always considered the starting attacker. So Rome in this case is the attacker. So they could declare any battle related strategy cards. As a reminder, those are the cards with the brown banner. They're not obligated to play them. They may decide to keep them for later play during the strategy phase, or they may declare them. The attacker declares first by putting out their cards and then the defender declares which strategy cards they want to play as part of the battle. There are a few cards that are exceptions that don't, do not have to be played or declared during this phase. This is one of the examples. So this ally desserts card can be played during this phase or it can be held in the player's hand and be played during the battle. Another example is Marharbal's cavalry can be played during the battle. The last example of cards that can be played outside of this declaration phase is the Elephant Fright card, uh, which we'll cover next as part of the Elephant Charge sequence. So I've moved the generals and their combat units down here so we can see them. In this example, uh, the attacker Varro decided not to play any battle cards, but the defender, Hannibal, decided to declare one of their cards. So we keep this here. The next phase is the Carthaginian Elephant Charge. This will only happen if Carthage has elephants in the battle. For an Elephant Charge to be successful, the army has to roll higher than the opposing army's battle rating. If there was no general in the combat, you'd have to roll higher than a 1. But that's also the case because Varro's battle rating is a 1. So Hannibal gets the chance. He's declaring an elephant charge. Now, before the dice actually gets rolled, Rome gets a chance to play uh, an elephant fright card if they choose to, if they have one in their hand and they'd like to play it. Otherwise, you execute the roll. If Rome did decide to play the elephant fright, basically the elephant charge would have no effect and Carthage would get a minus two penalty on battle cards received. But in this example, let's say Rome doesn't have the card or decides not to play it. So Hannibal's going to go forward with his roll. And remember, we just have to roll higher than the general's battle rating. So let's assume we roll. Hannibal gets a 2, so it's higher. So the elephant charge is successful. For a successful elephant charge, Rome's going to lose one battle card 
for each elephant in the fight. So since we have two elephants in the fight, let's put them over here to remind us that it was successful and Rome is going to lose a battle card for each elephant in the fight since we had a successful charge. If, however, Carthage rolls a 1 during the elephant charge die roll, this is considered a complete failure and Carthage will be penalized. So no penalty for Rome, but now Carthage will lose one battle card. Um, it doesn't matter how many elephants were in the fight. If Carthage rolls a one, they're going to get a minus one battle card penalty. But in this example, let's assume it was a success. Two elephants, so we know Rome is going to lose two battle cards. The next step in the battle sequence is to now deal the battle cards. The battle cards, each general will get a battle card for their general rating. So Hannibal will get four, Varro will get one, and they'll each get one battle card for each combat unit in the fight. Remember, elephants always count as combat units, uh, whether or not this, the charge was successful. So Hannibal will get eight plus two, so they'd get 10 battle cards for their combat units and four for the battle rating, whereas Varro would get one for his battle rating and eight for his combat units for nine total. And always remember to reshuffle the entire battle deck before the start of every fight. So we've dealt battle cards for the general's battle rating and their combat units. The next thing we look for is if there was a successful intercept, um, the army would get a plus one battle card. If there was an unsuccessful avoid battle, that army would lose a battle card. There's plus two battle cards anytime for Rome if the battle is in Rome. And there's a plus one battle card for Carthage anytime a battle is in a friendly tribe. But since this battle is taking place here uh, and there was no successful intercept or failure to avoid battle, these modifiers don't apply in this example. The last way each side can get additional battle cards is for having allies um, from controlled provinces wherever the battle is fought. So in terms of considering where the battle is fought, use a player aid like this. So if the battle is fought in Hispania, you would consider all the potential provinces in Spain. And in this example, we see that Carthage controls three of the four provinces. So they have three allies, three allied provinces that will assist them whenever the battle takes place in Spain. So in this example, Carthage is gonna get three additional battle cards and Rome's not going to get any since they don't have any allies in Spain. So there are the three additional battle cards for Carthage from Spanish allies. Let's look at a couple other examples of how allies work if the battle is in other areas on the map. If the battle took place in Africa, anywhere in Africa, you can see there's four total provinces where allies can come from. There's an exception, Western and Eastern Numidia both provide two battle cards if you have that province controlled. So in this example, if, if the battle was in Africa, Carthage would get two, four, five, six additional battle cards for having all these allies in Africa. If instead, let's say Rome at least had one province controlled, if this was the example and the battle was in Africa, Rome would get two battle cards for having Western Numidia as an ally. Carthage would get two, three, four. So there's the potential of six total additional battle cards coming from Africa because Western and Eastern Numidia provide two battle cards each for control. If the battle was in Sicilia, there's the potential to get up to two additional battle cards. Now keep in mind, if nobody had control in this example, then nobody gets a battle card for that province, but Rome would get one for having control of Syracuse. In this example, 
we see oh, Carthage has control of this province. Rome still has control of Syracuse in this scenario. So they would each get plus one battle cards from allies if the, if the battle occurred here. If the battle occurs anywhere in Italy, you can see all the provinces that can provide a plus one battle card if they're controlled. One key exception though is Italy can ever only get a maximum of two battle cards for Italian allies. So even though they've got all these provinces in this scenario, if the battle took place in Italy, they would get plus two battle cards where Carthage would get plus one since they've got control of this province. Also, when counting allies within Italy, uh, Rome doesn't consider uh, Rome or Latium. So they would just count one, two, three, four, five allies that they could get. Their maximum is two, so they get plus two battle cards where Carthage would get one. Also, if the battle was in Rome, allies are in addition to the plus two we talked about whenever a battle occurs in Rome. And whereas Rome has a maximum of two for Italian allies, Carthage doesn't have that limit. So if Carthage literally had control of four of these provinces in Italy, they would get four additional battle cards for a fight in Italy. All of the other areas on the map only provide the potential to get one additional battle card. So the island of Sardinia Corsica, if controlled, in this example by Rome, they'd get plus one, plus all the insignificant provinces. If the battle occurred up there, for example, if the battle occurred here in Massilia, Rome would get an additional battle card since they have control of it. Up here, it's neutral, so no one would get an additional battle card. So each of these insignificant provinces are worth a plus one if the battle occurs there and that side has control. Once both sides have gotten all their battle cards for all the modifiers and the allies and the combat units and the general ratings, don't forget to apply any penalties. So we know in this case, Rome had to lose a battle card for each elephant in the fight since the charge was successful. And then Rome declared, I'm sorry, Carthage declared this card. So they're gonna draw one battle card from their opponent's hand and add it to their own. So they'd randomly draw one of these. Both sides get to see what it was. So Rome gets to see what they're losing, and then Carthage would add it to their hand, and then we're ready to start the battle. Keep in mind the maximum battle cards any one side can have when dealing out battle cards is 20. So if a side earns more than 20, the cap uh, is 20 before we start the battle. And whenever these battle-related strategy cards are played, they're simply just discarded. The trade-off for playing one of these, you get an advantage in battle, but now you have one fewer card uh, to play during the strategy phase. So now that both sides have all their battle cards, we're ready to engage in the battle rounds, determine a victor, assign casualties to both sides, and then conduct the retreat. At the start of a battle round, the active side always starts as the attacker. The current attacker has the option to play a battle card, or they may decide to attempt a withdrawal and leave the battle. A withdrawal is possible if the current attacker can roll equal to or less than their battle rating, but it may be canceled if the defender can roll equal to or less than their battle rating. If the withdrawal was unsuccessful, either because they failed their roll or they successfully canceled the withdrawal, the attacker now immediately changes. Now the other side would be the attacker because the current attacker failed the withdraw. If the withdraw was successful, then the attacking army uh, must now move to an adjacent space. Uh, so if applicable, uh, they'd have to withdraw into the space from which they entered the battle. This is if they were the, the active side, the original attacker. You can't withdraw across a mountain pass, a strait, by sea, or into a walled city. And you can't withdraw into the space uh, from which enemy forces entered the battle, and you can't withdraw into a space with an enemy PC marker, any enemy combat units, or a hostile tribe, and you also can't split up your force with the withdrawal. Any generals or combat units that sortied out of a uh, walled city may withdraw back into that besieged walled city, 
and then a successful withdrawal always ends the battle. We would determine battle casualties. We would go to that phase immediately by rolling on the attrition table, but it's not considered a, a retreat. So we do not follow the retreat procedures. But if the current attacker doesn't want to withdraw, then their other option is to play a battle card from their hand. So in this example, uh, Rome has decided to play the frontal assault battle card. Now the current defender has to match the battle card or lose the battle. Now they may decline to match even if they have battle cards left and voluntarily decide not to match the card and lose the battle. That's their option, but in order to continue the battle, they have to match the exact battle card or use what's called a reserve battle card that acts as a wild card. So Hannibal has decided to match that frontal assault, and that's considered one round of combat. If the defender was able to successfully match the battle card, which they did in this case, they can now attempt to become the attacker. They have to roll equal to or lower than the general's battle rating. So Hannibal would have to roll a four or lower, and if they did, he would now become the attacker. If he is unable to roll that, then the attacker would stay Roman side. But let's say Hannibal does attempt a counterattack roll. He rolls equal to or less than his battle rating, so he's successful. So now Carthage is the attacker. Now they get the opportunity to play a battle card, and they decide in round two of the combat to play a flank right, which now Rome has to match. Let's say Rome doesn't have a flank right, but fortunately they do have a reserve. So you can use a reserve card, it acts as a wild card, as either a probe, a frontal assault, a flank left, a flank right, or a double envelopment. Basically it's a wild battle card that can be used as any of the other five types and it takes all the attributes of the card you use it as. So Rome decides to match this flank right with a reserve card matching it. Now that Rome has su successfully matched, they can attempt a counterattack die roll. Let's say he rolls a two, so he fails. It wasn't equal to or less than his combat rating. So Carthage stays the attacker, and now they would play another battle card. And so it will continue back and forth until one side is unable to match one of the battle cards played. The current attacker will also lose the battle if they completely run out of battle cards. So if they're the current attacker and they have no battle cards to play, they will automatically lose the battle. So that's one of the reasons why you may not attempt a counterattack roll. If Rome saw that Carthage played their last battle card and they were able to match it, then let initiative stay with Carthage because they will not be able to play another card and they would automatically lose. So let's take a look at the six different types of battle cards that you'll find in the deck. The first one is the Frontal Assault. It's the most common. There's 12 of these in the deck. The next are the Flank Lefts and the Flank Rights. They're the second most common. There's nine of each in the deck. The Probe card, there are eight of these in the deck, and there's a special power. So if the battle ends on a Probe, this lessens the CU losses the combat unit losses for the loser. They would only have to roll a minus two when they're conducting their retreat. They would roll minus two on the retreat table. So sometimes when the attacker plays a probe, the defender may decide not to match it because they wouldn't mind losing the battle on a probe because it would lessen their CU losses. The double envelopment card is the opposite. This would worsen uh, CU losses for the loser they would have to roll with a plus two modifier on the retreat table. The downside of playing a double envelopment card is if it's matched, the initiative automatically switches to the other side. So the current defender doesn't even have to roll for the uh, counterattack roll. They have the option of letting it auto switch to their side. In fact, since it requires a general to even attempt a counterattack roll, this is the only way for a force with without a general to become the attacker. If they match a double envelopment card, uh, the initiative can switch to them, and now they're the attacker and can play the card. Also keep in mind that this double envelopment auto switch 
is not mandatory. The defender can decline. And the last one is the reserve card that we've talked about that serves as a wild card and can be used as any of the five other ones and it takes on all the attributes of the card that it's replacing. So to complete this example, let's say Hannibal's the attacker. He plays a double envelopment battle card and Rome is unable to match it. So the battle would end after three combat rounds. The next thing you do once a battle ends is we will do one roll on the attrition table. Both sides are going to lose combat units as part of this battle, regardless of who was the winner or the loser. So since the battle took place over three battle rounds, that's the column we use on the attrition table. So we'd use column three. We'd roll one dice for both sides. Let's say we rolled a four. So both sides would lose one combat unit in this example. It's important for the losing side that you track the number of CUs lost throughout this entire battle process. So on the attrition table, both sides lost one combat unit in this example. So I'm going to convert that three into two and a one. And I'm just going to keep track that so far, the losing side Rome in this example has lost one combat unit. That's important because at the end of the retreat process, uh, the losing side is going to suffer political consequences where they're going to remove uh, PC markers from the board uh, equal to half a total number of combat units lost throughout the entire battle process. Now that the battle is over and we've determined a winner and a loser and both sides have lost combat units for battle casualties, the victor, Hannibal in this case, gets to stay in the spot where the battle took place but the losing side has to now conduct a retreat of their army. The first step of the retreat process is the losing side has to roll on the retreat table to determine retreat table losses. The column that's used is based on the size of the army in the battle, and this was the size of the army before battle casualties. So before this battle even began, Rome had eight total combat units. So we're going to see on the retreat table, there's two columns. If the army size before the battle began was one to four, they'd roll on this first column. And if it was five or more, they would roll on this second column. You'll remember the modifiers. So if the battle ended on a probe card, it's a minus two modifier. In this example, the battle ended on a double envelopment. So it's a plus two modifier. So let's say Rome rolls a one, they get lucky with a low roll, but they'd have to add a plus two since the battle added on a double envelopment. So that'd give them a total modified die roll of three. And on this column, that'd be the number of combat units lost, three for the retreat. So from their roll on the retreat table, Rome is now gonna go from seven combat units down to four combat units. They lost three on the retreat table. Again, we're just going to keep track of that. So they lost one from battle casualties, and they lost three from the retreat. So now their current force is at four. Three other rules about the retreat table. First, if the attacker lost the battle because they simply ran out of cards and they couldn't play a battle card, there are no modifiers. Uh, you wouldn't use the minus two for probe or plus two for double envelopment. Also, the first casualty on the retreat table would have to be an elephant if there was one present. So always if there's an elephant, the first casualty from a retreat would be that elephant. And then finally, if this was an amphibious force that came into battle through a, a naval movement action and they lose the battle, the entire force is immediately eliminated. So now the retreating army has to decide where, which space on the board to retreat their army into. Uh, the first option, is obviously they could retreat inside of a friendly, unbesieged city within the actual battle space. Uh, the combat units would still apply based on what the city could hold, but they could split their army. So they could retreat some combat units into the friendly, unbesieged city and then retreat with the remaining force. Most of the time, they're going to have to retreat to the closest space possible up to four away. And that space has to contain no enemy combat units. And then either 
it has to be one of their friendly PC markers or a space with a larger friendly army that they can join. So unlike avoiding battle, where an empty space was okay, an empty space isn't okay here. They have to find a friendly PC marker or a space with a larger friendly force that they can join. And obviously that space cannot contain any enemy combat units. Also, any size force that's defeated in battle has to be retreated, whether it's commanded by a general or not. Unfortunately for the losing army, they may also suffer combat units along this retreat path. They're going to lose one combat unit for each enemy combat unit they encounter, each enemy uh, political control space that they enter, and each unfriendly tribe that gets passed along the retreat path. So since Varro and Rome were the original attacker, they always have to retreat first into the space where they attacked from, and then now they've got to figure out where they can go to. We know an empty space is not okay, so they can't stay here. So they've got to find an eligible space to retreat this army to. So since I don't see a larger Roman force anywhere that Varro can get to, that's the closest friendly space for him to retreat to. Unfortunately, he cannot go this way because you're not allowed to retreat across mountain passes, straits, or by sea. So here is Varro's only eligible retreat path. The battle took place here. One, two, three. Unfortunately, along that retreat path, Varro crossed one enemy PC marker and two combat units. So that's minus one, minus two, three. So he's going to lose three combat units as part of that retreat process. The combat unit loss happens immediately when the space is entered. So immediately when Varro entered the space, he lost the three combat units. That's important when checking for a larger friendly force. So if that larger friendly force was on an enemy PC marker, Varro's army would first lose the combat unit, and then you would evaluate if that army was larger that he could join. So we can see that during this retreat path, Varro has lost a total of three combat units. So we'd move these over here. So this battle has been costly for the Roman army. A total of seven combat units lost during the entire battle process from the attrition table, the retreat table, and now the retreat path has resulted in that number of CU losses, leaving him with one force that he can have with him on the board. Remember, any generals that are left alone without combat units after the retreat table roll or the retreat path are displaced. Scipio and Hannibal, when they get displaced, they get completely eliminated from the game, never to return. And if it is Hannibal, Carthage also has the additional penalty of removing immediately five PC markers from the board. Here are some other retreat path rules. If the retreating army was the original defender, they're not allowed to enter the space that the attacker came from or re-enter the battle space during their retreat path. Also, any friendly army that's encountered along the retreat path with fewer combat units must be picked up. This is one instance where the 10 CU limit for movement does not apply, so all friendly armies of a lower size have to be picked up along the way. Also, any lone enemy generals have no effect on the retreat, and they simply get displaced if the retreating army enters their space. And also, if there are multiple eligible spaces that are equally distant away, the retreating army may choose. You can also violate the finding the closest space rule if the alternative retreat path leads to fewer CU losses for your retreating army. Unfortunately, if there is no eligible space, the entire retreating army is eliminated. The final step of the retreat process is the losing side has to suffer the political consequences from their defeat and their retreat. So that side has to remove PC markers from the board equal to half the total number of combat units lost during the battle process. So again, this is the battle attrition table, the retreat table, and the retreat path losses. That's why we kept these tracked here. So a total of seven combat units lost divided in half would be three and a half. We round down all fractions. So the Roman side has to remove 
three political control markers from the board. The game is also immediately lost if the PC marker losses cannot be met. The lost combat units can just simply be returned to the supply and that completes the retreat process. Let's cover some of the notable strategy cards that may require extra explanation. The native guide card, only generals with strategy ratings of one or two may use and also get the modifier ability on the card. This stacks with other mountain pass modifiers and if the army crosses two separate passes, you're allowed to modify both. The Hostile Tribes card, this may be played versus a moving army, a stationary, stationary army, or stationary combat units without a general. The Philip of Macedon card is first only playable as an event by the Carthage side, which would create that modifier, and then when it gets eventually reshuffled into the deck, it's only playable by the Rome side. And if Rome plays it, it obviously cancels the alliance, but it also forces the Carthaginian player to randomly discard one of their strategy cards. And then after that happens, we completely remove this from the strategy deck. With any of the reinforcement cards, combat units from events cannot be placed inside a besieged city. With the African reinforcements card, there's ever only a maximum of four elephant, elephant combat units in play at any time. The Traitor and Tarentum card still requires that the army has a minimum of three combat units uh, to complete the siege attempt, even though it doesn't require a die roll. The Spy in the enemy camp is played at the start of any combat. The revealed battle cards are displayed face up, and they remain open to view throughout the battle. If this is used in conjunction with Event 59, Ally Deserts, player may select one of the visible battle cards or can randomly draw one of the unrevealed battle cards. Hannibal Charms Italy. Hannibal can remove the PC from the space he starts in as long as he uses one of his movement points to do so. Uh, this benefit may be used in spaces where Hannibal overruns combat units or where the Roman army avoids battle. The Carthaginian siege train. Uh, the Carthage army can move with the siege train plus 10 combat units, so it doesn't encumber movement at all. It has no effect in a normal battle. It may not cross an alpine pass or use sea movement. And if it's ever caught alone by enemy combat units or it's, if it's forced to retreat, it's removed from play. But it stays if the army avoids battle. Carthage may replay this event uh, to place the siege train again or move to a different army if the siege train was only was already in play and only one siege train is allowed on the map at any time. With the campaign cards you can't move one general multiple times and each general must complete its entire activation before the next general is activated. If you're sieging with the card um, only three combat units, five if there's a console army, and the activated general are considered to have moved. The remaining units and generals in the space are available for further operations on the campaign card. A combat unit or subordinate moved by one general may be moved by another general during the same campaign as long as uh, neither the combat unit or the general moves more than the four spaces. And then all unit movement points are spent once they battle, siege or subjugate, fail a pursuit, or back up from the intercept. They're basically done for the campaign. Also, only one siege or subjugation role is allowed against each city or tribe per campaign, but the first campaign could be used to battle the defenders and the second used to execute the siege and subjugation role if different generals were performing each action. The bad weather card, no combat is necessary for the card to be played, but it must be played prior to any die roll beyond the second movement point. Once the die roll is allowed, the card can no longer be played. And it must be played before the player conducts any naval combat die rolls or mountain pass attrition rolls. Uh, the bad weather card can only be played against primary movement, not against interception, retreats, avoid battle, etc. If it's played against an army crossing a mountain pass or a strait, 
the target army may not cross if it needs to use the third or fourth movement point to do so. If it's played during a naval movement of any kind, the naval portion of the move is completely cancelled. The embarking force must return to its port and remain there. If it's played against a campaign card, it truncates the move of only one force and must be declared before another force moves as part of that campaign. If naval was cancelled, another general can't use naval during that same campaign, and it affects the movement of the general and not the combat units. So combat units moved by two different generals can still use their four movement points. The elephant fright card. Uh, the elephant combat units still count as combat units, even if the elephants were frightened, but the Carthaginian player does not roll for the elephant charge, and then he loses two battle cards if and when the elephant fright card is played. The card must be played, though, before the elephant charge die roll is resolved. With any of the allied auxiliaries card, it may only be played as an event if there is a eligible general that exists. So combat units have to be placed with a general in Italy and can't be placed in Rome if there is no general there. Any of the cards, such as the ep Epidemic, that targets an opposing army, the side that plays the card gets to choose the army. The Messenger Intercepted card allows you to draw one strategy card from your opponent's hand. There's an official variant that when you play this card in an event and get one of your opponent's card, uh, your opponent has the option to have you play once again in the strategy phase. The Hanno Council's Carthage card um, prohibits Carthaginian CUs from leaving Africa until the strategy deck is reshuffled, but Carthage reinforcements may be placed outside of Africa. They're just not allowed to leave Africa. Normal reinforcement rules pertain. The card affects CU movement only. Uh, generals are okay. And this is in place until the start of the next turn after reshuffling. Uh, the same general rules apply to Cato Council's Rome. So while Roman CUs are prohibited from moving to Africa, Rome reinforcements may be placed with an existing army in Africa. Normal reinforcement rules pertain, um, and the card affects, again, CU movement only. Generals are okay. And again, this is in place uh, until the start of the next turn after a reshuffling. Ally deserts. This may be played before any battle cards have been played, or it can be held in the hand to be played in any round of the battle. Both players may observe which card uh, gets pulled, and if played in combination with the spy in the enemy camp, the, the player may select one of the visible battle cards if desired. With the Force March card, specifically the one with three ops points, uh, you may use a Force March three op card to make a naval move in addition to moving the force uh, three spaces over land. can also be used to move a general by C twice. Uh, each C move costing the army three movement points. The general could pick up and drop off combat units along the way, but still no more than the five uh, limit as part of C movement. And then combat units may accompany either of the C voyages. Finally, the truce card. Uh, this requires that the deck be reshuffled at the end of the turn. The deck is always reshuffled, regardless of whether the card is played for the ops points or the event. Some of the rules. Uh, any friendly units already on enemy PC markers may remain there. Enemy PCs underneath units may not be converted while the truce is in effect. Uh, combat units on enemy PCs at the end of the turn are still going to suffer attrition. You can't intercept or siege, but any existing siege points will stay in place, and you may still move through and subjugate neutral tribes. The truce doesn't prevent that. Also, uh, specific cards which do not break the truce are counter cards, such as storms at sea or bad weather. Any events that move an army uh, such as the campaign or the force march card, they do not break the truce, and events that can't be fulfilled uh, obviously cannot be played in, as an event in an attempt to break the truce. Also, Carthage does not have to roll on the naval combat table during a truce. Next, let's cover all the generals in the game 
and their special abilities. Hannibal's special ability is that once per battle, he may use a probe card as either a flank left, a flank right, or a double envelopment. As Drubal is actually the only general in the game with no special ability. Hanno's special ability is he may remove a Roman political control marker if he ends his move on the PC space without engaging in battle. An overrun is okay. As a penalty, Hanno may never leave Africa, although he may, he may sail between African ports. Mago receives a minus one naval combat modifier when using C movement. And Gizgo's special ability is he may avoid battle and he's able to intercept on a die roll of one, two, or three, even though his battle rating is only a one. Publis Scipio has a strategy rating of only two when he's in Hispania. Titus S. Longus may counterattack to try to get initiative on a roll of one or two if he was the original attacker. Gaius Flaminius may pursue or prevent withdrawal on a roll of one, two, three, or four. Fabius Maximus, he's actually able to avoid battle on a roll of one through five. As a penalty, he may never leave Italy, but he may sail between Italian ports. Marcellus has a plus one siege modifier if besieging with a campaign card. Now this is only sieging against cities, it's not trying to subjugate tribes. Gaius Nero may use six movement points when moved with a campaign card, and it's any movement point combination. Varro may intercept on a roll of one to four. Aemilius Paulus may counterattack on a roll of one to three if he was the original defender. And finally, the great Scipio Africanus, he may roll two dice on the siege table whenever he's besieging with a force march card. Now this is sieging cities, not subjugating, but he may roll two dice and actually apply both results. So those are all the generals for both Rome and Carthage. And that should be everything you need to set up and play Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage.